Good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Uh, I'm Dick Morningstar. I'm the founding chairman of the Global Energy Center at the Atlantic Council. And it's really a tr huge pleasure for me uh, to welcome our guest, uh, Mara Sheshevkovich, our good friend, uh, who is the European Commission Vice President for uh, institute for interinstitutional interinstitutionalized that's a tongue twister relations and foresight. Uh, <clears throat> previously, Vice President Shevkovich was the Vice President for the Commission for the Energy Union, and we're certainly thrilled uh, to have you here today. Uh, and we have a live audience as well as a, a very large virtual audience of which I'm one. Uh, I think there is no more important time, uh, Mr. Vice President, for you uh, to be here uh, and no more important time in the transatlantic relationship uh, than where we are today. Uh, your prior experience with respect to the energy union coupled with the need now to work together uh, to coordinate strategies <clears throat> for the short term and for the longer term uh, is absolutely critical. Uh, in your prior role, uh, I think you recognized as much or more uh, than anybody uh, in Europe uh, the problems of the dependence uh, on uh, Russian gas. We talked many times about Nord Stream. And I guess we won't have Nord Stream to kick around at this point uh, anymore, at least not for a long, long time. Uh, <clears throat> you also uh, played a huge role uh, in <clears throat> negotiating uh, the last transit agreement in 2018 or 19 uh, between Ukraine uh, and, uh, uh, and Gazprom. But we're facing really critical issues, both for the short term and the long term. And we, gas is obviously very important right now. Uh, and we have to be sure that gas, <clears throat> that, that, that gas is something that we recognize is important, that we're working on, but at the same time, not, not forgetting the necessary message with respect to climate issues. And that it, gas and the new and the energy transition are not, uh, it's not an either or uh, proposition. So we have to look at the role of gas. We have to, uh, again, not forget the climate strategies that you'll be working on uh, and need to coordinate as you're working on things like batteries that you're working on, new technologies, carbon taxes, critical materials, uh, and any number uh, of issues. You're in the middle of everything. So uh, we are really looking forward uh, to being with you, uh, to being with you today. In a moment, I'll turn uh, the floor over to Julia Friedlander to moderate this discussion. Uh, Julia is the C. Boyden Gray Senior Fellow and Director of our Economic Statecraft Initiative at the Atlantic Council, which is part of the Geoeconomic Center, who we're happy to be working with uh, from the, with the uh, Global Energy Center as well. So if you all have questions, you'll be able to submit them on the Q&A function uh, on Zoom. Uh, for those who, who are in the live audience, uh, the staff will have tablets that you can submit a question on. Uh, remember, this is on the record, uh, and it will be available on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, and now let me turn it over to Julia uh, to... Uh, uh, carry on the discussion with uh, Vice President Shevkovich. Thank you, Ambassador Morningstar, and a warm welcome. Good evening, uh, Mr. Vice President. It's a pleasure to have you here at the Atlantic Council. I know you've had a long day of meetings with the U.S. administration, and it will continue tomorrow. So we're very happy that you've taken the time to join us today. Um, I would like to offer you just a minute at the beginning if you'd like to share some opening remarks. Thank you very much. And first and foremost, I really would like to uh, appreciate uh, uh, the fact that uh, it's again Atlantic uh, Council an institution uh, which is very much esteemed uh, uh, not only in the United States but also in Europe and I would say throughout the world uh, because of uh, your strong transatlanticism and that's uh, exactly uh, the reason I arrived today if you allow me just a couple of uh, brief remarks I will start on uh, with Ukraine and I will end 
with uh, Ukraine because this is uh, absolutely the question um, uh, of today and I, I think that uh, to deal uh, with this tragedy, with, the, with this drama, to give the, the hope and support uh, to our Ukrainian uh, friends, uh, which simply have to uh, foster our transatlantic uh, uh, bonds uh, even more than before. My initial idea when we've been planning this visit was uh, uh, to talk how we can cooperate more on energy with Ambassador Morningstar. We've been working a lot uh, on that uh, with uh, uh, my very good friend Amos Hochstein. We've been, we've been uh, meeting a lot of challenges in, in that regard. And then I also wanted to discuss with our uh, American uh, uh, partners how to avoid the future dependencies uh, for example, in, uh, in areas of key technologies or in the critical raw materials. But of course, uh, all this uh, was uh, um, overtaken by the situation which is uh, really on uh, all of our minds and where we clearly need uh, uh, to work as closely uh, as uh, possible. So what is very important, uh, I think we have demonstrated over the couple of last days, uh, uh, this, uh, I would say, unwavering, stellar, transatlantic support for Ukraine. And I think it's, it's very important to, uh, to uh, underscore that. And uh, all our efforts are now focused on how to stop uh, the terrible and useless war, war how to deal uh, with Russia, how to help Ukraine uh, to rebuild uh, and to be stronger uh, than uh, it was before. And, and I would say how to fight uh, uh, for our values, which have been so, uh, so savagely attacked uh, over the last uh, uh, two weeks. And indeed, as you, as you said, I had uh, uh, excellent meetings uh, this morning and this afternoon uh, uh, with uh, uh, Director Avril Haines, also with the Deputy Secretary uh, uh, David Turk, and very much uh, it also focused about uh, the, the situation of uh, our hands. So, just very three quick points uh, to start of our discussion. I think, and I would start with, uh, I hope, uh, uh, almost quoting uh, the words of uh, Director Haynes, because I uh, totally agree with, uh, with her view on how important it is to be as connected as possible these days, uh, and uh, how critical uh, it is to share our perspectives. And I think it was so uh, clear over the last few days when we've been coordinating our uh, position vis-a-vis -vis the sanction vis-a-vis -vis Russia and where we are still coordinating our, our support uh, uh, for, uh, for Ukraine. And I, see, and I see here enormous potential uh, for developing strong uh, transatlantic alliance partnership uh, in the area of foresight. Uh, what we see on the horizon, what we see um, uh, from, the, from the longer term perspective, how can we complement each other's perspective views and how can we really cooperate uh, uh, in a way that we would forge the world as, as we would like uh, to see it. Then I think a uh, second very uh, important point, which I think would be very much uh, on our agenda, is how can we do better, Europeans and Americans, uh, and how can we strengthen our collaboration on the global uh, supply chains. I think we have seen how dramatically they can get interrupted during the COVID-19 crisis, but we also see that uh, how dangerous dependencies we are developing in uh, the area of critical raw materials. Therefore, I was so happy that uh, uh, today both the uh, Department of Energy and the European Commission, we supported uh, this close cooperation between European Battery uh, Alliance mm -hmm. and, and Lightbridge because I see enormous potential for working together on substituting some of the critical uh, materials, recycling them, but also getting them uh, where, where we need. And uh, uh, the, the last point, uh, uh, I would make uh, is uh, very much uh, again uh, on uh, importance uh, to work uh, more together on uh, uh, energy uh, security. I just uh, uh, presented uh, to my interlocutors uh, uh, today in a great detail what the European heads of states and the government uh, decided last Thursday. We want to reduce as much as possible and as quickly as possible our dependency uh, on uh, the import of fossil fuels for Russia. It's extremely challenging tasks, but it's possible to do. We, of course, uh, would need to develop further the networks, the contacts, the, the good uh, cooperation which we started with uh, Ambassador Morningstar, uh, with, uh, with Amos uh, Hochstein, to work uh, on energy infrastructure, on LNG, 
and we very much appreciate uh, the assistance support we got from the United States uh, during this winter because uh, it was not given that we would overcome it without uh, any curtailment of services, uh, which uh, now is uh, already the case. And the last point, which I think uh, uh, would underscore, I believe also frame our discussion of this afternoon, is to say that uh, for us, the Russian aggression against Ukraine uh, is a 9-11 moment for Europe. And you saw how Europe became energized. You saw what uh, tectonic shift has happened over the last uh, few days. And I'm not talking about the sanctions. I'm talking about the, 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 the development in the, in the German internal and foreign policy. I see it about uh, the way how the European institutions uh, are dealing uh, uh, with uh, assistance to Ukraine, in, in including the, uh, the uh, military uh, material, and uh, how much we are ready to, uh, to bring to the table. And I, I think that uh, we just simply have to uh, uh, work on this because we see that our help, our assistance to Ukraine is very important. We see that when we are united, uh, uh, what, kind of, uh, 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 what kind of economic uh, uh, damage we can inflict uh, uh, through, through sanctions. And uh, simply uh, after this uh, drama and tragedy, we can follow on our, uh, on our screens. Uh, I think uh, we have to make abundantly clear to anyone uh, today in the future that if you, if you want uh, uh, to infringe upon our values, in the, if you want to attack your peaceful neighbor, it will have a price. It will have a very, very high price. And therefore, I believe that uh, this moment uh, would, also, uh, um, would also contribute to this uh, energizing, uh, to this uh, dynamizing of the transatlantic bond, which would be so important. Uh, uh, in uh, uh, these uh, coming days, months, and I would say it would really shape the way how the world would evolve uh, in this century. Thank you so much, and we have so much to talk about. And love, thank you so much for that overview. I have a few, well, more than a few questions of my own. We'll see where we go. Um, but then we'll also be taking some questions coming in here on the iPad. Um, to start off, maybe I can ask you a little bit more about what you say is a 9-11 moment for Europe. I'm a New Yorker, so when you say that, I take it seriously. How, how does that affect strategic foresight, right? If you, did you, um, was any of this in your, in, on your radar beforehand? And how does it affect how you, uh, how you put together your analysis of, uh, of how Europe can handle these issues going forward? Yeah, I, uh, thank you very much for that question. And I think uh, I was very glad when I had the chance to discuss it with my interlocutors that we are, we are, we are uh, facing a little bit the, the same challenge that uh, very often you had it on the, on the, on the uh, radar screen, but how you make your horizon scanning, how you make your, your foresight uh, actionable, how you make it strategic in a way that it would lead uh, to, the, to, the, to the decisions. And, and very often, of course, you work uh, with the material which is, which is sensitive or, 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 or classified. Very often it's market sensitive. Uh, so, I mean, you always want to do the right thing. So you want to avoid some kind of negative self-fulfilling prophecies. Uh, but I think, therefore, what would be very important uh, uh, would be to have this transatlantic cooperation, because if, 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 if both of us and our partners would have the same thing on the radar screen, so that's very probable that something like this is going to happen. And then it's, it's better uh, we would act uh, together in a coordinate, coordinated manner uh, to prevent uh, the, the, the negative developments from, from, from happening. And I think that uh, uh, this would be the challenge, how to bring sometimes inconvenient truth to the top, how to, uh, uh, how to make it uh, digestible for our political leaders, how to offer uh, uh, the solutions and how to proceed with a, with a close coordination, because uh, this is something what is, uh, uh, what is important. I mean, uh, nobody likes inconvenient truth, but at the same time, they have to be mentioned, they have to be said, and we have to do our utmost at our leaders would make uh, as informed decisions as, as possible. And, and therefore, I think the uh, close cooperation in between foresight communities, uh, and uh, uh, I also believe that think tanks uh, like yours, like Atlantic Council, have a lot of contribute because you offer uh, the possibilities to brainstorm, uh, to discuss, to you know, look at it from, from, from uh, different, different uh, perspective and have a bit of more free-flowing discussions like uh, when you are on the record and you have a political political responsibility. And I think we need to find the ways how to cross-fertilize, I would say, the official channels with the think tanks, just simply to 
uh, to generate the, the best uh, possible uh, advice and recommendation uh, for our for our political leaders, so we can actually uh, really proceed and, and make uh, uh, well informed uh, decisions. Sure. Well, here at the Atlanta Council, we certainly like to hear that. I'm sure there are many institutions around Washington who would be very happy to participate in such an exercise. Maybe you can give us a little more of an insight about well, what is that sort of? There's been unprecedented transatlantic communication here, yeah. right? And um, the coordination, but just you know, just a little on the outside, now that I'm on the outside, I notice the back and forth, right? The constant back and forth, the constant conversation. How have, how, 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 how has that developed over the course of this crisis, right? So when, when did you realize, okay, we're gonna sit down mm -hmm. with the Americans and we're going to be able to calculate this through in such an, in, in such an unprecedented way? As you, as, as you said, I think we, we, we had this uh, uh, ongoing communication uh, um, uh, with uh, uh, our American partners, uh, which was going on, um, I would say, nonstop. But uh, we have seen and we've been coordinating more and more closely in the course uh, of autumn, winter, because it was quite clear that uh, uh, the energy security issues uh, uh, made the, this terrible comeback. Indeed, we've been in, 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 um, in the situation and we've been looking from all the perspective how to make sure that we would have uh, um, uh, enough energy uh, uh, to manage uh, uh, through winter. You probably already have seen uh, how demanding this is from the, from the side of uh, energy prices. For, for, for gas, I mean, we are paying nine times more than the consumers in the US. For electricity, it's between five to six times more. For the, for the same megawatt, uh, megawatt hour. Uh, but nevertheless, we've been, uh, despite of these price hikes, uh, we've been still faced with a uh, with, with situation that we might not have uh, enough, uh, mm -hmm. especially of gas, by the, uh, by the end of the winter. And I very much appreciate that here there was this uh, close coordination and collaboration going on throughout uh, the, the last semester and throughout the winter. And also thanks to this good cooperation, I mean, we secured this unprecedented 10 BCM of LNG just for, for January, which is kind of pushing us over uh, uh, the winter to the spring. And, and, and one of the issues I was discussing here this morning and this afternoon uh, was uh, what can we uh, do together that we'll make sure that uh, uh, this year we will have by 90% full gas storage is before, uh, uh, before next uh, winter starts. But also, uh, what can we do to, to cooperate and to work together uh, to reduce the dependency on uh, Russian fossil imports by, by two thirds uh, in in coming uh, couple of couple of years, which is uh, again a uh, uh, huge huge challenge, and it would really uh, require our good and close uh, cooperation. And then, of course, uh, uh, this is just the energy, but we have we have seen uh, the dramatization. Uh, over the Ukraine um, uh, war and uh, once, I mean, the, the invasion has started, I have to say there was unprecedented uh, uh, level of uh, mutual contacts, coordination, collaboration within, within uh, the Europe uh, where uh, uh, the, the, the European Commission was, 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 uh, was acting. Uh, as an actor who um, has this helicopter view on how uh, you know the measures which we've been about to adopt would affect uh, every single member state, how we can make sure that we would have that uh, that unity, and I think that uh, leadership of uh, the president of the Commission, president of the United States, and uh, heads of states and government, which was demonstrated uh, last uh, week in, in in Versailles, indeed unprecedented, and and I would say that here we we clearly. Uh, demonstrated that on such a sensitive uh, issues we can cooperate, we can cooperate with classified information, we cooperate uh, on very sensitive uh, topics, and, and if you do it right, that it has immediate impact. Absolutely, um, and certainly from our perspective, many of the actions are coordinated in ways we never could have foreseen. Um, and so that's a credit to you, it's a credit to colleagues in the US administration, yeah. and to, to the entirety of the commission and to the council. Um, Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what the deliberations are over energy right now. If you think if you go on Twitter, which is not necessarily a reputable source yeah, of information, yeah. but it's certainly a source of many opinions, right? You see anything from stop the gas right now, we can handle this, you know, well, 
we'll, ba we'll batter down the hatches, save a little bit of energy, we're coming out of winter now, to we can't do this, our, ener our industry will suffer a hit, the, the Russians will retaliate, please don't touch the gas. And so where is, where is, the, where, where is the sort of median lie now? Yeah. And what do you think, um, I don't know, what, what would you recommend? Yeah, I think immediate line is that I think we, we uh, have adopted uh, uh, the strategic uh, uh, decision that uh, uh, we are going to get uh, rid of the dependency on uh, Russian fuel imports because, because we see that uh, energy supplies could be weaponized we have seen very, uh, very uh, unstandard, and I'm here diplomatic, behavior of the Gazprom throughout the, 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 the last, uh, uh, last year. And uh, uh, we see that what uh, uh, I would say this dependency uh, uh, could uh, uh, entail. And uh, therefore, what um, <coughs> we are doing right now is uh <coughs> if it comes uh, um, uh, to the overall approach, indeed, uh, we are much more exposed uh, to the dependency uh, on uh, Russian fossil imports uh, uh, than the United States of America, because uh, you are importing only 3% of, of oil from Russia, import 25%. Uh, so as uh, one of the prime ministers uh, put it last week, if we, if we stop it now, we might have a problem with the, uh, the petrol station already, already the next, uh, uh, next, next month. Uh, with the gas, uh, I think there we can, uh, we can manage uh, throughout the winter, even if there would be immediate interruption. But then, of course, uh, uh, when I was uh, describing the situation, my American colleagues, is that uh, if we want to go, and that's our goal, to reduce our dependency at least by two-thirds, so uh, we would need 50, 60 uh, billion of cubic meters uh, of, of, of gas to get from other uh, destinations. And, uh, of course, uh, here we would have to make the, the hard choices because, uh, from one side, uh, uh, for the, for the medium-term objective, we would need uh, uh, those uh, uh, supply. And I know that for the suppliers, very often it would mean uh, to extend the operation. So they would need to make uh, an investment. And they, they want to know also uh, quite exactly from us how much gas do you need, for, for how long. And uh, therefore, we are now working on, uh, on a detailed uh, proposition in, uh, in respect uh, how much gas we can uh, save or not need because of our uh, Green Deal and because of our uh, Fit for 55 uh, uh, strategy, which means uh, to, to cut the CO2 emissions by 2030 by 55%. Uh, what can we uh, achieve through the energy efficiency, through uh, production of the of the green hydrogen and there are uh, billions and billions of cubic meters which we can uh, which we can uh, save in that way but still we would need in the in the in the in the, in the medium term quite substantial uh, quantities uh, of gas and and that would be of course uh, the challenge of uh, uh, challenge of this year with the oil again the market is m more liquid uh, because it's not so well let's say pi uh, pipeline pipeline driven but at the same time we are importing 25 percent which is which is a lot so it's a it's a it's a strategic decision it's it's a political decision we are going to uh, to pursue it and we'll be looking for the for the best way how to get rid of these dependencies as quickly as possible mm -hmm. this is a specific follow-up question because this is something we've been debating within the council is um, given that shipping companies have pulled out of Russia, right, won't, won't service Russian ports, insurance companies have pulled out, how liquid is the oil market now in Europe? Is Europe actually physically importing Russian oil now, or is there sort of a, already a de facto embargo in place? Of course, I do not have the, the latest, latest on, on, on this, but I know that uh, looking at, uh, uh, you know, the fact that we import 25 percent of, uh, of oil, I mean, it just, just shows that it's... Uh, uh, still uh, quite uh, a quite big uh, dependency in that regard and therefore we will be uh, of course looking for uh, for other uh, for other suppliers and therefore also the decision of US administration to give that I would say political and economic signal to release uh, a bit of oil reserves and we of course hope that uh, uh, that, uh, the, uh, that the producers of oil just simply see what is now happening in the world that we are kind of uh, uh, redrawing the uh, the map that uh, that we are now building completely new international uh, uh, architecture, international uh, uh, 
peace uh, uh, frame, international, international order. And, uh, and, uh, and I understand that probably not everywhere is as strongly felt as in Europe, as uh, in the United States, but that's, I think, the, the consequence of, of the Russian, Russian aggression, that we have to look at everything with, a, I would say, fresh look. With a, with, a, with a new approaches, with a new new solutions, and that of course these are the these are the times and moments where I think everyone would remember for a very very long time uh, how your partner has been behaving in this in this very difficult in this very difficult situation, and therefore I think it's it's important to have this very uh, honest uh, honest converse, conversation with uh, with our with our partners because. Uh, I mean, um, Russia just brought war back to Europe, which we thought that it was unthinkable just uh, three weeks ago. Yeah, absolutely. It really does um, really make you think about how you change your calculus, right? On, on, on the dime, almost. Um, to that regard, I mean, do you think that many of these difficult energy-related decisions that the EU is going to have to make are in some ways, um, it's, this, was the, this was the accelerant for a direction that you had hoped to take Europe in anyway, right? Towards renewables, towards um, energy sustainability, you know, removing um, over-reliance on certain partners. Um, so how much of this was already, how much was, was, was already in your head? I, I think that, uh, of course, uh, um, if you look at what happened um, over the last, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, two weeks, the, uh, uh, the I would say, historic uh, uh, decision uh, on uh, getting rid of dependencies on uh, fossil fuels import uh, from Russia. Very important uh, German decisions on, on energy mix, uh, on uh, Nord Stream 2, on uh, the new uh, military strategy. Uh, the, 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 the fact how the uh, NATO and allies are reinforcing their position in, uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, the unprecedented way, uh, how we are supporting financially, uh, technically, but also uh, uh, from, the, from the point of view of, uh, of the equipment, uh, Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, defense. Uh, so all this is uh, uh, unprecedented, and I would, I would not be honest if I, if I would say that we've been uh, pre prepared for this. I mean, we've been going in, uh, in, the, in the direction of uh, uh, reducing uh, quite significantly our gas consumption by by uh, 20, 2030. So we had the the, the, the fundamental uh, fundamentals in place, but of course uh, this uh, 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 this war uh, just even further uh, pushed up uh, the prices. It has of course a huge uh, uh, inflationary spillover effect uh, over all 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 products uh, and. Um, um, it makes it from one side even more desirable to accelerate uh, the production of energy for, uh, for renewables, uh, to go uh, for high energy efficiency, for, for green, green hydrogen, uh, for faster completion of our uh, energy, energy infrastructure. But of course, it would be done in a much more accelerated way. Uh, but at the same time, it would be, it would be uh, more demanding because I mean, the, the environment is much more complex and much more difficult than it was before. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm um, going to have to ask you about the money stuff, right? I mean, so the EU already took unprecedented steps during the COVID crisis to issue its first euro bond to help economies recover from uh, COVID-related crises from a recession then. Um, we're potentially heading towards, um, unfortunately, a second recession. And no one knows what's happening. No one knows what the actual effect of this crisis is going to be on the European economy, or the global economy. But uh, what do you think the EU is prepared to do, right? Both to help finance this you know, forced energy transition or accelerated energy transition, but also to help uh, shield the impact of what, what's going to be felt in the broader economy. From, I, I would say, again, I will start with Ukraine and then I will come to EU's economy. I had uh, a very uh, good meeting this morning with uh, my former colleague and very good friend, uh, Kristalina Georgieva, Georgieva, the head of um, IMF. And I think it, it was quite clear that uh, if, if you want to be well prepared, we have to think uh, over, over the horizon uh, how we're going to, to help rebuild Ukraine. Clearly, we would need to think what we can do to, to rebuild uh, 
the destroyed houses, apartments? What you can do to help them to rebuild uh, uh, infrastructure? And how can we boost uh, the investors' confidence to go and invest in that country? It would be a huge, huge task uh, for all of us. And therefore, I think here the, 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 the global community of, uh, of democracies would have its uh, really work cut out because it would be extremely demanding, but at the same time it would be uh, our solidarity duty uh, to do that and to be as helpful uh, as we can. Coming back to, 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 your, to your question, um, I think that here, um, in a way, uh, we've been kind of lucky that, uh, that we bet uh, on greening and uh, di digitizing and making more resilient uh, European economy. And um, indeed, uh, the unprecedented decision uh, which uh, created a new way how to, how to finance uh, this transition was uh, adopted the, the last year. And uh, maybe for the, for the sake of information of our audience, uh, if I kind of simplified, usual EU budget uh, for uh, seven, seven years is around 1.1, 1.2 trillion euros and um, uh, with uh, this, uh, this new way uh, where we are working on financial markets and uh, uh, where we are raising capital uh, through, uh, through in, in, in this way we, uh, um, we, we plan to, uh, to raise uh, for example also through these green bonds uh, like 800 billion euros so it's like almost getting we are getting second second budget and we've been focusing uh, and therefore, I mean, there, uh, until now, all our, uh, all our um, uh, bids on the financial market, uh, all our offers have been oversubscribed because uh, what we are offering through this financial product is um, actually the highest level of uh, ESGs, um, highest level of uh, uh, the, the focus on uh, the, the projects which are actually accelerating the energy transition and digitization and resilience of the of the european economy and of course we in the european commission we like numbers <laughs> so 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 what like we decided was that we should go for at least 37 for the green projects 20 percent for for the digitization and and the rest uh, has to go for for the support of structural reforms uh, in in uh, our in our member states and and, and it's quite i would say significant uh, uh, it has already quite significant impact uh, on uh, the European economies because uh, we already brought uh, uh, quite uh, some financial support into the into the national economies in exchange for these reforms or for or for the for the projects of, of this magnitude. So I think that actually the that that the massive new financial uh, instrument of 800 billion uh, euros will will help us also in this energy transition and in a way in the energy security because wind and, and solar are indigenous uh, mm -hmm. sources and, and, and therefore I, I would say it, it would I believe help us a lot in, in, this, uh, in this transition. But uh, overall um, economic situation I think uh, we are faced with the same. I mean the, the danger of uh, high inflation. Uh, there is also I would say the the possibility that it might be linked uh, with the uh, slowing of the, of, the, of the economic growth. Of course now, I mean, the, uh, with this uh, uh, senseless war uh, in Ukraine, all the, all the fundamentals have been changed. So I'm sure that all central banks, all the uh, central institutions are kind of rewriting the forecast, doing the impact assessment, uh, uh, what kind of impact this would be on economic performance, what it would do for investors' uh, confidence to invest, mm -hmm. because if the times are uncertain, investors are hesitant uh, to invest, what it, would, what it would do with, uh, let's say, with the purchasing power and um, with the potential worries of the people. So, all the, so I would say the fundamentals have changed over the last two, three weeks, and, 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 and therefore I think we, we have uh, to put uh, <coughs> all options on the table how to deal uh, with, uh, uh, with this situation, but I think that uh, as I said, we, we agreed on 800 billion. It's, it's quite, quite a sum of money on top of the, of the, of the, of the uh, usual, usual budget. And, uh, and we, will, we will do our utmost to use uh, this uh, uh, money and this 
investment in the, in the most efficient and useful way. Mm -hmm. No, it's interesting because, you know, and, you know, I'm a veteran of observing the Eurozone crisis. It's almost turned into um, the you know, Eurozone is becoming a safe asset because it spends, not because, yeah. because it doesn't spend, yeah. which is, I think, a crucial, a crucial difference there. And what do you think about, is this, a, is this a permanent change for the EU, right? Is this a permanent move towards uh, fiscal and financial integration? That's, I think it's the broader question that a lot, a lot of us are asking here in D.C. I, I think that uh, um, there was a lot of talk about the Hamiltonian moment mm -hmm. of the of the of the EU. I mean, it it was a, of course. I mean, the uh, um, especially you know among the the uh, the think tanks and journalists. I mean, there is always I mean look for the nice uh, uh, expression how to how to describe. But 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 in these it, this was I mean uh, 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 enormous milestone in in further. Uh, integration uh, in um, the fiscal in, uh, integration it, it pushed us uh, even more towards direction on on, on uh, uh, banking union on creation of uh, of the financial financial markets uh, union and I think and and also the fact that uh, the demand uh, f uh, for these bonds uh, bonds was so huge the, the conditions have been so so favorable and uh, uh, the way uh, how the, the the leaders decided uh, this money should be should be spent, you just don't just don't spend it on anything. There was very very clear purpose that this money goes for modernization, for 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 greening, uh, for revitalization, for uh, for digi digitization um, and structural reforms. I think it was it was very very crucial. So I think that what would be, of course, uh, very, very important that uh, we as an as a EU and our uh, member states will now pass the test uh, just to show that not only we, we learn how to raise the money on the financial markets, but we spend it well. That there was the reason to go in the direction and we see that we did the right thing and it, it brought appropriate, appropriate result and, and it, create, it created new opportunities uh, for, the, uh, for, the, for the EU. And, and therefore, we are so, I would say, insistent and so, so diligent from the side of the, uh, of the Commission on the approval of these recovery plans, on meeting the priorities, and, and the money uh, is released only when you hit so-called milestone, I would say, the, 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 the crucial elements when we see that all the reforms have uh, been executed or is it planned, so it's, it's not uh, money for free. So, I mean, we collectively agreed. These are the priorities, and we collectively agree that uh, only when the milestone of these priorities are met, then the money is released. And I think so far it, it works quite well, but of course, uh, as I said, now we are living in, in another world, mm -hmm. and there will be more and more challenges that we could have anticipated just a couple of weeks ago. Sure. No, I mean, I think that's an important point that you make yeah. about the implementation. I think in the United States, we're very good. We're used to throwing money at the problem, right? But, but again, following through is always the, is always the key there. Um, I'd like to ask you a little bit more about the euro, right? I think that so, you know, in reviewing what um, the unprecedented transatlantic coordination on the sanctions, right? The most unprecedented and impactful measure has been the freezing of the central bank reserves, Russian central bank reserves. The United States could not have done this alone, right? If we had decided to do this, we would have frozen 8.5 percent. It was only because we did it together that we had the yeah. impact on the Russian economy the way we have, which which makes me think that. You know, the euro is starting to adopt more of a more of a role as a global actor, as a national security actor, even right. And what is that? You know, do you think that that resonates in capitals, in, with you know local central banks? That you know the as we move forward in this crisis, um, that the transatlantic cooperation means that this is a new era for the euro. I I definitely think so. I mean. Uh I think that if you look at uh, the frozen fro uh, frozen assets, I, I, I think actually that it was even higher portion of uh, of Russian central bank assets in in, in euros uh, than in than in oh, much dollars. Much more, much more, yeah. And and uh, therefore it was absolutely crucial, and, and therefore I was uh, uh, indeed very appreciative today in 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 in, in my meetings that uh, the coordination on this measure was so so crucial because I think. Uh, uh, this came indeed as a surprise uh, uh, to Russian uh, leadership. Indeed, it's it's unprecedented uh, measure. I think that was a right thing to do because it had immediate impact on 
on volatility of, of, of ruble, on, on the fact that uh, Moscow Stock Exchange is, is still closed, on the listing of, of, uh, uh, of money uh, uh, Russian companies, on uh, leaving of the top internationals from, from, uh, from, from, uh, from Russian mar market. So I think uh, by this, the, these measures, which was working very well with other measures, we kind of demonstrated that uh, we've been absolutely fair, correct, and precise to say that if, 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 you, if you invade, you will pay very, very high price. And I think this is what is, what is, what is happening. And, and I think that what would be very important is uh, uh, to cooperate even more between, I would say, dollar and euro in the, in the future as, uh, as a first and, and second, um, I would say, uh, um, uh, international um, uh, currencies. And also uh, to see how also this measure would in the future um, uh, impact uh, uh, the digitization of our, of, of, of our currency, the international role of, of uh, hard currency. And, and as I said, I mean, we kind of entered into the, into the uh, new role, in a new, new world, uh, new, new era. And uh, uh, I think that even by, uh, by these measures and by impact this measure has had, I think uh, it was uh, uh, quite clearly demonstrated that, uh, uh, that the euro has very, very important uh, economic but also political impact. And I think we are mm -hmm. fully aware of that. And, and of course, as you can imagine, uh, uh, to proceed with such a step, it, it requires the coordination not only among the member states, but also among central banks. And, and, uh, uh, and this is exactly what has happened in a very short period of time, in a very constrained uh, 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 environment, uh, with no leaks, but really uh, very decisive action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that um, we're watching that very closely. I mean, I, I run a program about economic statecraft, and so of course it's very, it's very important to me. I was not going to overlook asking you about that, which, which leads me to ask a little bit more about the anti-coercion instrument, right? I mean, that was, it was a sort of novel concept that's come out that the EU would sort of use asymmetric tools to respond to external pressures. It was about China primarily, right? And, and, and now we're coming to a new a new era where, no, it's also about Russia, and maybe it's who knows what it's, who, who it's about. Maybe it's about the United States. Who knows, right? Um, what do you think that the role of those, that concept is going to be? I, th I think that uh, it's, it's uh, 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 part and parcel uh, of uh, what we also realize, especially during the, uh, during the, 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 the COVID times, that uh, you have to work on uh, uh, having more space for our, let's say, autonomous action as a, uh, as a, as a EU and, and simply that we have to use our economic power and, uh, uh, and, um, and, and the fact that we are the uh, biggest uh, uh, trading bloc um, in a way that uh, if somebody tries to coerce us, we have also our means to, to, defend, uh, to defend ourselves. Uh, uh, and uh, that was, I would say, the, the, the reason behind it. On top of it, also we we also learned um, our lessons that we have to be more careful if it comes uh, uh, to the foreign investment. So I mean, if you mm -hmm. if you kind of push for unbundling uh, of the of the energy sector, and then you have uh, big foreign entities uh, uh, coming and buying to unbundle the parts of the same company mm -hmm. and kind of rebundle it uh, somewhere very far in uh, one very big and important capital. So then, then, <laughs> then of course, I mean, they're kind of missing, missing the point and, uh, and uh, that we became, we became vulnerable because not everyone uh, in, uh, in this uh, uh, free trade environment was also playing fairly. And uh, therefore, I, I, I think the things at the start of the century, so many fundamentals has changed uh, that we have to adjust uh, our tools uh, uh, for autonomous action, for, uh, for the protection of, uh, of uh, our, our interests. And I think that, uh, uh, especially uh, this year, it was so obvious that the democracies, uh, that the traditional West uh, transatlantic relationship have to be, uh, have to be further, uh, further uh, consolidated. Because if you looked, for example, at uh, uh, the, the democracies index, so we have seen that um, uh, from the beginning of the, of the, of the centuries, 
how we've been, we've been a little bit losing out. That if you look year after year, how many countries are are considered to be governed by by democratic uh, governments, and how many countries are governed by the uh, straightforward authoritarian regimes or governments with authoritarian tendencies. So I mean, um, we, we've been kind of. Uh, Losing out over the last uh, last uh, few years, and and uh, let's be honest, I'm sure that now the perception has changed. But I still uh, remember a couple of years ago that there was even some appreciations from the from the top uh, business leaders for the tough decision making and quick decision making in 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 uh, in Russia and China. That you know you do not have to consult the local community, you do not have to go for environmental impact assessment, and so on and so forth. So I think that. Uh, um, uh, today they have a different perspective, different perspective. Where, where would you like to do uh, your business? Where you, where, where you would feel better? Where you would feel safer? Where your family would like to, uh, mm -hmm. to live? Even the, the Russian oligarchs uh, decided uh, where it's better for them. Sure. Not now, but before. Mm -hmm. but, so therefore, I think that, of course, the, the democracy is, is, is a high maintenance system. You have to work on it. You have to, uh, you have to permanently communicate, uh, work with your uh, interlocutors, with your, with your stakeholders. But in the end, I think um, also now it's, it's, it's quite clear what is, what is the better system. So I think uh, we are kind of reopening a new chapter. And I think uh, that we have to, to project that the positive power of, of democracy, of uh, stand up for, for values and uh, um, the efficiency, actually, and fairness uh, uh, of, of our system, that we are fair to people, we are, we are fair to an uh, environment, at least we try to do our best much more than, uh, than, than others. And these should be the, the qualities uh, which should be decisive in this century, and not brutal force, uh, uh, indiscriminate fire of innocent civilians as we see it now in Ukraine. Sure. Yeah, I mean, tell me a little bit more about the humanitarian situation. Right? I think that here in Washington, we're watching TV, we're talking to people, but we're not in Europe and we don't understand fundamentally like you know in our in our bones what's going on in your country your native yeah. country Slovakia is on the border of Ukraine um, what is it what is it like now um, to be in a major European capital standing in a train station I think that uh, when uh, uh, I uh, when I started to read my briefing papers uh, uh, yesterday for my mission to US uh, there was 2.2 million uh, refugees from Ukraine coming to uh, to Europe now, before I uh, came to this meeting, it was 2.8 million. So, so, so we had within, within like, I think, two weeks, almost 3 million refugees. UNHCR is estimating that it could be somewhere between 5 to 8 million. And from, from one side, these are really, I have to say, heartbreaking uh, pictures because you see, like, uh, as, a, as, a, as a father or, or, a, or a husband, brings uh, the wife and, and, and the kids uh, to Slovak border or Polish border or Hungarian border or Romanian border or Moldavian border, lives back uh, with, uh, with uh, Kalashnikov and, and, and the women and children are, are, are coming um, uh, to our places. And, and I have to say that uh, the way the, the public re responded is, is uh, I mean, extremely heartwarming. I mean, you... you Indeed, you, you feel from one, one, uh, one side heartbroken and from one side extremely proud mm -hmm. that uh, uh, actually you can, you can help to, to, so many, uh, to so many people. And, 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 and it's done, of course, on the, on the institutional, on the, on, on, on the level organized by central, local government. But I would say overwhelming majority of, of the refugees goes to open houses, apartments, to the, to the, to the concrete families who are not asking nothing. Uh, for that, but of course, I mean the, the 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 numbers are overwhelming, and I have to say that the state, local governments, uh, volunteers, everyone is in on 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 the verge of uh, uh, collapse out of exhaustion because it's extremely extremely uh, demanding, traumatizing at the uh, at the at the at the, at the same time, uh, and we all know that uh, uh, we are there for a, for a, for a long haul. What is the I would say, uh, for me as, as, as a father, most traumatic is to see unaccompanied minors. Mm -hmm. We don't know exactly how many children 
uh, is arriving tomorrow because not every child has a biometric passport or the, the documents and, and you have like hundreds and thousands of cases that the, that the children as small as uh, 10, 11, 12 just came through across all the uh, all Ukraine with just phone number written on their on they, on they hand because they, 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 their parents uh, couldn't, couldn't, couldn't go with them for one way or, or another um, reason. And, and what is extremely important uh, is, and we are working uh, very hard uh, with uh, our member states, with, with Europol, to make sure that uh, these small children will get uh, the guardianship as quickly as possible. So they will not end up in some kind of uh, uh, despicable gangs, but they will end up with a, with a, with a proper guardians that we will know exactly where they are and and what we did was that we adopted again in in express manner so-called uh, temporary um, uh, protection mechanism meaning that from the day one and it doesn't depend on any document uh, you have you will you will get health care your kids could go to school and you can you can you can work if you if you mm -hmm. find if you if you find the work of course what it means for for most uh, uh, of our new uh, frontline state is that we are thinking about second shifts uh, for Ukrainian children in the school, that we are trying to, um, to kind of recruit uh, the teachers or I would say the, uh, the refugees who speak Ukrainian so, so the, the children would get back to, I would say, normalcy as, as quickly as possible. So they need the rhythm, they need to see, you know, that they are in, 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 uh, in a collective so they would not be uh, tra traumatized even more by all families looking into the mobile phones trying to get the information about their loved ones and of course the pictures which are coming from from Ukraine you, you see this heroic resistance but you see a lot, an unbelievable and unprecedented destruction so uh, that's that's the the, the task which is uh, uh, enormously high and, and therefore we also from the EU level are already uh, approving new financial mechanisms how it can help these frontline countries, not only from the human humanitarian aid, food, medicaments. Uh, um, uh, we, for example, organized 10,000 hospital beds for, this, uh, refu uh, for, for these refugees because uh, there's a lot of uh, young uh, um, uh, pregnant women and we are now you know, organizing the transport throughout the whole Europe, how we are transporting them to the, to the, to the hospitals because the, the, the hospitals, I would say, close to the border are overwhelmed. So it's, it's enormous logistical uh, operation. Uh, but I have to say that uh, the solidarity is unprecedented and, and uh, we have to work on it uh, uh, to make sure that we would have the stamina, we would have the financial material support that this could continue until, until it's needed. Thank you so much. And of course, we're going to arm Ukraine, we're going to punish Russia financially, but what, what, is, what can we do um, as Americans here to contribute to the humanitarian effort? I, I think that... Um, from one side, I think it's, it's uh, very important that uh, we would really act and cooperate as, as allies because I think uh, this is uh, not strategic challenge anymore, the Russia is strategic threat. We have to stop it, we have to stop the war, we have to work together uh, on uh, 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 giving not only the hope, but assurances, guarantees that Ukraine we will help you rebuild. We will help you to prosper. We will help you uh, to be that, 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 that magnet for, for everyone there uh, to live in a prosperous, democratic uh, society. That we would uh, clearly uh, look at Ukraine as a, uh, as a, as a member of a, of a European or, or Western, 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 Western family, which I think it's, uh, it's very important. And if it comes to the uh, hu humanitarian Eight, uh, right now, I think that the, the cooperation is working quite well. I mean, if it comes to the, let's say, materials uh, uh, support for medicaments and, and, and all these, I think we are, we are managing and we are also managing to, um, uh, to help our, our Ukrainian partners. Of course, I mean, over the time it would be more and more difficult. So any assistance in, 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 uh, in that regard would be, I'm sure, uh, uh, welcome. We are working very well within the EU member states on uh, providing the possibilities, uh, especially for those, uh, those uh, refugees who, uh, who are um, uh, now in these four or five uh, frontline uh, member states that they 
they take them on. So I mean, we see how they are, how how we manage to. So Slovakia has now, I, I would say, around 150, 160 southern. It's a country of uh, five mm. million people. But we see that uh, the, uh, that the Czech Republic is taking more and more Germany, France, Netherlands, uh, Belgium, Austria. So every everyone is is really extremely extremely uh, cooperative. Uh, uh, but I think uh, um, um, uh, over, over the time, I'm sure uh, that uh, more cooperation and assistance would be needed. But I think that we have to now focus on what should be the priority, stop the war and give uh, Ukraine very, very clear assurances. We are with you, we will be with you and we help to rebuild your uh, beautiful country. Thank you so much. Vice President, thank you so much for coming to the Atlanta Council. Thank you for coming to Washington, spending your time with us. We wish you the best of luck. And um, thank you for your collaboration with the United States. Transatlantic cooperation is what we live for. Thank you very much for your kind invitation. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll hand it back to Ambassador Morningstar to close us out. Well, thank you. Thank you, Julia. And thank you, uh, <coughs> Vice President Shevkovich and, and Julia, uh, for just a wonderful and really critically important conversation uh, during this uh, very difficult time. Uh, it was really great. In fact, we had, uh, including people in the room, uh, well over 200 people uh, attending. There'll be, there'll be more watching it online. But that just goes to show how important uh, this conversation was and how important U.S.-EU cooperation and coordination is. I mean, when, when push comes to shove, it's going to be the U.S. and the EU. They're the ones that are always going to be together. And this was, uh, uh, this was really important. Uh, I want to thank those who helped to put this on. Uh, program on Olga Kakova, Patty Ryan, James Batchik, uh, Niels Graham, uh, Davishel Hamilton, Christopher Cassidy, and <clears throat> the Geoeconomic Center, the Europe Center, working with us at the Global Energy Center uh, for this to happen. Uh, encourage, we encourage all of you to listen tomorrow uh, to our program accelerating the energy transition, how the First Movers Coalition is driving decarbonization with the private sector. Uh, you can find that on our website. Uh, and also, hopefully you'll attend virtually or some even in person, our Global Energy Forum in, uh, uh, in the UAE on March 28th and 29th. So again, thank you to everybody and again, particularly Vice President Shevkovich for joining us and for being such a good friend over the years. And uh, I'm going to sign off now. So thanks very much. <laughs>